Welcome to the Colby Cast, episode 181. Thank you for joining us. Today, Bonnie and I gather in the kitchen with Colby husbands and fathers, Tony Gazaldo, Everett Bayarski, and Craig Lengel. From our fond early memories of cooking to the steps that led us to be chef dad, and on to some of our favorite recipes, techniques, and equipment. Grab a glass and join us at the table for a discussion of dads that cook. We hope that you'll enjoy the show. Hi there, I'm Bonnie, Colby homeschooling mom of four lads and lasses, liturgical musician, popcorn, and podcast fanatic. And this is Stephen, homeschooling father of five and director of development for Colby Academy. Hi, Stephen. How's it going today? Going very well. Um, this is the the tipping point. I think I think fall is beginning for us after today. Yeah. So yeah. So it's just good. Hopefully, it's not tricking us. We might have a little bit right. left yet right. of the heat. Yeah. It probably will, but. I can hope. All right. It's all right. It's it's been nice to have a little bit cooler to to uh, have some warm coffee. I've been drinking cold beer all summer, so now it's nice to have a warm cup of coffee and yeah. Although I could drink it hot in the summertime too. Anyhow, that's beside the point. But <laughs> <laughs> we have gathered some friends here today to talk about things relating to food and cooking and feeding our families. We've got with us Tony Gazaldo, Colby's middle and high school online learning director. Hi Tony, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. I'm glad to have you visiting with us again. It's been a bit, you've been overdue to come back and visit with us. So I'm glad you're here. Happy to be back. <laughs> Good deal. Everett Byerski is back with us, Colby's Academic Services Director. Hi, Everett. How are you? Doing well, Bonnie. It's always good to be here. Thank you. I appreciate every time you come visit with us. It's always a good, good conversation. We also have Craig Lengel, who is uh, Mrs. Megan Lengel's husband. Craig was with us for episode, what number was that? I just wrote that down. Where'd that go? Craig is with us on episode 126, Digital Citizens. He and Megan were visiting with us, giving us a lot of good information about the whole digital landscape. And um, so many of our Colby students make use of that and how to use that well. So Craig, hi, happy to have you back. How have you been? I've been great, Bonnie. Good to be back. Good good to see you again, you and Steven. So guys, we I know each of you is very handy in the kitchen and that's what we are talking about today. This episode's coming out in uh, November-ish time of year as there's a lot of that food prep going on. And it's, I think, a perennial topic to talk about food and cooking and how we make that happen for our families. So let's get started with how each of you would describe your food slash cooking slash kitchen related interests and how those came to be. Tony, you want to start us off? Sure. Um, so uh, I grew up um, uh, with uh, grandparents who cooked. Um, so I've got, I'm have got half Italian and half German. And so the Italian side was uh, very much Italian American uh, food. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I joke that, uh, you know, there's, there's that movie uh, Ratatouille where uh, in terms of the movie, the, the food critic tastes the Ratatouille and is instantly transported to being a child, I think in his mother's kitchen. And for me, uh, meatballs do that from the Italian side. So I'm a good, a good, good Italian meatball. I'm instantly, you know, seven again in my grandmother's kitchen. Um, and then you know, on the German side, uh, you know, a lot of different German foods and um, you know, grandfather's a hunter. So there's lots of smoked venison and things like that, um, that, that uh, he loved to do. Um, and then my, my parents' generation uh, held on to some of that, but that, I think most of the families were uh, two income families. So that's where, you know, we, we lost a little bit of the, the culinary tradition, still preserved some of it. Um, but I definitely entered adulthood not knowing how to cook anything. Um, and then, you know, married life comes around and uh, uh, I, I didn't know how to cook anything. My wife knew how to cook some stuff, but we both are full-time workers. And so uh, I really, uh, before we even had kids, I very much wanted my kids to grow up with uh, like knowing how to cook themselves and also growing up in a home where, uh, you know, maybe not a, a daily, you know, scratch meal at dinner at the dinner table, but definitely having some food traditions so I tried to uh, uh, teach myself how to cook uh, a lot of things. And uh, my poor wife had to suffer through years of awful, awful food. Uh, famous stories of me trying to make cornbread, like the simplest thing. And at least at least three or four cornbreads, you know, being chucked out the back door like a Frisbee because uh, I failed so badly <laughs> at it. Uh, but, you know, over over time, you know, you watch enough uh 
food shows, you just spend a bunch of time in the kitchen. Eventually, you, you know, you start to get some trial and error. So now I, I can, you know, prepare a meal competently um, at least. Um, but it, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a fun story, fun stories for early married life. Um, and now I've got, you know, my own kids and uh, you know, my, my, my oldest likes to bake. And so we do a lot of baking things. And my, uh, my six-year-old daughter, uh, just, you know, any chance she can do anything in the kitchen at all, she loves doing things. So we try to, you know, when we can, because sometimes, you know, kids slow you down. So sometimes you just don't have the time and you got to give them easier tasks. But I like weekends when we can really, uh, you know, spend a couple hours preparing something, even if it's, you know, even if it's like a 20 minute meal, you know, so that's kind of how I, I came around to being the, uh, the cook of our house. And my wife is happy to not have to carry that because she has no interest whatsoever in managing that and, and being a working mom. So. Sounds like that works beautifully for all of you. Do you have some go-tos like shows or books or things like that, that you have that helped you initially or that you keep returning to or things like that? Yeah, I have to, I have to point to Alton Brown, I think is the the guy who helped me understand cooking you know, and understand why things work the way they do. So that was really helpful. Um, Cooks Illustrated, I think, was a good uh, an early source for recipes once I was able to start kind of like going off my own and not just making out and brown stuff. Um, and what else? Uh, I like um, for a, a recent edition for Wild Game, uh, Hank Shaw is an awesome resource for for different recipes. He's a He's a, a former Washington Post reporter who, in a second career, took on, uh, first of all, he he started hunting in midlife. He had no contact with it, but then he, um, you know, he uh, learned to hunt, but then I think, I believe he also went to culinary school. So he's, he's an actual chef. And so his stuff is, he does more with wild game than just grind it up and make burgers, which is really fun. Uh, not that there's anything wrong with burgers, but... Uh, so he's, he's a good source too. He's a, he's one I've recently discovered. So that's quite a repertoire. It's fun having a big toolbox, you know? Yeah. Craig, would you tell us about you in the kitchen? Yeah, no, I mean, it's, uh, it's an interesting story because, you know, growing up, um, I had sort of a, a traditional family, right. Where, where my father was out, you know, out of the house, uh, working most of the time. And, my mother was kind of the day-to-day caretaker. And so she did, I'd say the majority of the cooking, um, growing up, but, um, to be honest with you, she just, she wasn't, it wasn't an interest and she wasn't very good at it. Um, and my father would actually cook, you know, during, um, the holiday meals, anytime it was something special, right. So a Christmas dinner or Thanksgiving dinner. And of course he would, he would like most fathers in the summer, he would grill, um, you know, on the, on the barbecue grill, some burgers and, and steaks and, and things of that nature. And so it was always interesting because his food was always so much better, right? Like his, his food, he just, and, and, and it's not, not a knock against my mom. It's just that he approached it differently, right? He didn't necessarily follow a recipe, his approach being a chemist, right? So my, my father was a chemistry major. He would approach it very much of, you know, seeing what we had what in the cupboard and what flavors tended to go well together right so mixing your sweets and sours and adding vinegar as an example to pancake batter on saturday morning which was like why are you doing that right but what he was trying to do was attempt to create like a buttermilk type flavor you know from a from a natural perspective and so i just kind of followed him when he would make these you know quote unquote special meals and i just i learned i guess the chemistry of of food and and what you know, kind of constitutes good flavors that blend together well and, and what doesn't. Um, but that being said, I didn't really, I didn't really cook, you know, that much, you know, as a, as a college student or even early and during the, the first years of marriage, um, Megan and I would split that duty. And then, you know, Megan was, was the primary cook, I'd say until she got real busy with, with Colby. So starting, you know, 2013, the online school, 2015 timeframe, and Colby being a West Coast company, if, uh, you know, if, if we wanted to have a, a consistent family meal, I would have to jump in and start making, uh, making dinners. So I started doing that probably in that time frame. So going on, on about 10 years ago, um, maybe a little less. And then, but I'd say my, my cooking was very rudimentary, um, you know, just basic stuff that I would make. And it really wasn't until we remodeled our kitchen and I could 
cook a lot more versatilely, right? With with a, a vent hood and I can sear at high temperatures and things like that now where I'd, I'd say I really started experimenting more because that way I'm not setting off the smoke detector every time I try to cook something, right? So, <laughs> um, and so now it's just, it's it's kind of, it, it grew out of necessity and now it's just something that I've always enjoyed doing. Um, and then another area that I've expanded on that was, you know, kind of related to what Tony was saying about, you know, being outdoors and doing the hunting, even though I'm not a hunter, I am a big outdoorsman. I'm a, I'm a camper, right. As a scout leader, I learned to cook, um, over different fuel sources, right. So learning to cook over real wood and, and charcoal, like real good charcoal wood when you're camping and learning the different techniques of you know, how to sear a steak directly on coals if you don't have like a real grill to use and just different techniques for cooking out in the wilderness um, really kind of added an element of, of flavor to food that I never really explored until recently. So that's that's been a really fun evolution. Delicious too. I just wanted to say, I love the fact that it's Colby's fault that you do all the cooking. That's fantastic. <laughs> uh, that, was, that's a, that was a story that I was not previously aware of and I love it. <laughs> Okay, Everett, what about you? You know, for me, I grew up, my, my father's a landscaper, so he had some flexibility in his timing, uh, and he enjoyed cooking more than my mom did. Uh, and my mom tended to work uh, longer hours. She worked for the Forest Service, so a lot less flexibility working with the government. Um, and he did most of the cooking growing up. Um, a lot of his meals tended towards the, the simple. I mean, he's, he grew up in the upper Midwest. Um, so most of our meals were protein, carbs, vegetable, and you know, kind of pick your, is it, is it, uh, you know, is it chicken? Is it, uh, you know, is it, uh, venison? Um, you know, is it potatoes? Is it noodles? Uh, and what, what are vegetables of choice? Um, but at the same time, he, uh, we growing up in, in Alaska, um, and, uh, my father being a landscaper, we had some significant gardens. So the, the majority of our food tended to be homegrown or, or home harvested. You know, so most of our protein was, was salmon or halibut or, I mean, venison, caribou, bear. Um, I ate very little beef growing up, which is was actually fun. I didn't even realize uh, how weird that was until I got off to college and uh, beef was about the, you know, what people had. Um, and then, you know, we had uh, all kinds of, we had potatoes and we had, uh, I mean, tomatoes and, and uh, we grew corn in Alaska, which was uh, uh, a weird thing for people to be doing uh, at the time. And, you know, peas and lettuce and everything. Uh, we had a salad during the summers. We'd have salad basically every night for dinner from, I don't know, you know mid-April to, to late September. Um, so I just grew up eating kind of real food. Um, and and he just uh, he taught me how to make you know pancakes when I was in late elementary school and just kind of let me do things in the kitchen. Uh, throughout middle school and high school. And in, in high school, I was actually responsible for, in the summers, uh, when we didn't have a school, I was responsible for one dinner a week at home, just as a way to kind of reduce pressure on on, on my parents of less things to do. I mean, my mom, my mom certainly did some of the cooking, but uh, he tended to do most of it. And so, you know, I went off to college and I didn't I didn't hate ramen, um, uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I wanted to, you know, be, be, you do a little more than that, having grown up with real food. And the cafeteria is fine, and I do that sometimes. Um, but I actually started buying groceries once a week, and um, I do a, a home cooked meal in the basement of our dorm, and invite a couple of friends over. Um, and then after leaving the seminary, I, uh, moving off campus, I just started making all of my food, own food. I did you know shopping and, and everything else as a again, it was just something that I'd grown up with. I couldn't imagine trying to you know whatever the apparently the typical thing that college students do just didn't uh, appeal to me at all. My future wife was delighted to learn that I'd be happy to be involved in cooking as we were dating. Um, and the first time I met my future and mother-in-law, uh, they were over visiting at the place that I had. And I was horrified when she told me that she was going to microwave a chicken breast for dinner um, in, in, in the microwave without any seasonings or you're just going to might. No, we're, we're not doing that. Um, the microwave is to reheat things that haven't been cooked. So I'm mean, actually, you know, actually, so I cooked this, uh, you know, she had a kind of a special diet that's low carb and whatever else. So I, I mean, so I cooked it on, you know, on the, the stove with, I mean, Italian seasoning and garlic and you know, a little bit of lemon juice, as a, which was, uh, you know, I mean, I guess mind boggling to, um, part of her family that, you know, that'd be a, something that I just be like, oh yeah, sure. Of course. That's what we do. Um, so I mean, earlier in marriage, she did some of the cooking, but it became really apparent that I actually enjoyed doing it. And she just did it because people needed to eat, uh, because apparently the kids are into eating like multiple times every day. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just ended up taking over. Nice. Nice. I think okay. my journey is 
might be more similar to Tony's in some some ways because I had a grand a grandmother in particular who was just known in the whole town as like you can stop by your house and she'd throw out like this huge spread. It's like, oh, eight people, sure, just come here. And it was interesting with her though. So it was definitely Midwest, you know, uh, this is rural Wisconsin back in the I guess this would be the eighties was where I remember, but, but I mean, she could pull like a can of spam and mix it with other things and it was still good. And it was, I, I kind of cringe at that and say, how did she do that? But that's just what, how she, how she did things. Whereas like in my family, my, my mother was the primary cook, but she worked full time. She didn't really like cooking phenomenal baker, but not cooking. So I still have memories of coming home from school and smelling the apple pie and things as I walk in the door from when my mother had the afternoon off or whatever. So that was always, always lovely. But um, my, my, and my grandfather was actually a, a cook in the military at, at one point. So he was competent as well. Well, more than competent, but my grandmother did most of the cooking, but um, I didn't really do a whole lot of cooking like most young men, because I went to college and my, one of the first times I, I had spent time with my wife was she had invited some of my classmates and and I over to her house to, and she made this like nine course medieval dinner. So she's, I thought, all right, I've got a good cook. Once we started dating here, it was fantastic. Um, I think for us, the big point came when I shifted from being an engineer to working in distance education, we were close to family. And so we would, well, actually we, we kind of, we were like in a back house compared to the front house of her her parents. So, so at that point, it was when it was dinner. It was her her parents, usually a sister or a couple sisters, a couple could be a brother or two, and my wife and I. And at that point, young children, and she was involved in the homeschooling and the and working as well. And when we had small children. It just kind of got to be the case that you know. Um, I could hold a baby who's going to start screaming because it wants to nurse, or I could cook dinner. And um, that seemed like the better choice at that time. And I, st I think that was the wise choice. But it, it kind of, I think that rekindled some of that, my grandmother's cooking for large groups of people. So then it's like, oh, my, my wife's college brothers are bringing home their friends. And it's like, okay, I can throw together a meal for 20 people. That's, I can do, you know, but... Yeah, I, I think America's Test Kitchen was was a big because they I loved it because they're so scientific about it. So I could actually learn something and then apply it to other things. Um, and then I also had a a, a cook a, an Italian cookbook. I don't do a lot of Italian cooking, but Marcella Hazen is the author, and and she just talked about doing this authentic Italian style with fresh things and and different techniques. And I would just enjoy reading that. And then especially when we're living in Southern California, where you've got fresh produce year round, it's like, well, that's what we should be using then. So get get to the farmer's market, get some of these delicious ingredients and, and throw them in, figure out, figure out how to make that work. But screaming children are cooking. I mean, and that seems really prudent to me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I also, I think I also kind of learned from my father-in-law who liked to cook, um, but for him, he was a college professor. He carpooled to work. So it was his first time of the day after breakfast that he's kind of alone and quiet time. So watching him pour himself a glass of wine and then start to prepare a meal when I wasn't preparing the meal because we kind of shift off. That was also like, as a, as a very introverted person, quiet time before dinner after work became just a love and the glass of wine doesn't hurt either, but, <laughs> but it's just a lovely experience there that, that I encountered. I love that. We know one of the things I know, several people have mentioned memories associated with food. Um, do you, people have one or two favorite memories, food memories um, that they, they'd be interested in sharing just kind of what connects them or speaks to them about food and or cooking. I can share one from grandma Mary's kitchen. Um, on a holidays, the the whole you know the whole extended family at, at my grandmother's house, she always had like a, a ri like ridiculously big pot of gravy in our. It, we call it gravy. Some Italian Americans are going to say it's marinara or sauce. Don't call it gravy. We call it gravy. 
I'm not apologizing for it. Big vat of gravy full of a ridiculous number of meatballs. And uh, long before dinner was going to be served, the grandkids would wander into the kitchen and Grandma Mary would give you a meatball on a fork with a bowl because it's dripping in gravy, right? And and so like the, the little ones especially would wander back in the living room. They've all got a bowl with a giant meatball in it. You know, that's a fond memory for sure. Um, and just the smells and things. I think the, the, the smells, like, like Steve mentioned, the smell of apple pie, you know, in the, in the kitchen when you come home. Uh, those kinds of things I think are are awesome to like grow up in homes where that kind of thing can happen. You know, I mean, even if it's not every day, you know, this thing, fresh baked bread, cookies in the oven and apple pie, or in, in my case, gravy on the stovetop has a certain smell that just puts me back for sure. So. Yeah, I love that. You know, for me, it's it's funny. I mean, one of my favorites growing up is, is actually, uh, we called it spaghetti growing up. Um, uh, when my dad made it, I'm pretty sure it'd be more accurate and Tony correct me on this to call it some sort of like a ragu or a bolognese. It's a meat sauce, basically. Um, but uh, again, that my, my dad kind of just developed over time this random recipe that involved tomatoes and meat and just kind of put them all together. And, and I've kind of evolved that, you know, into my own version of it using Italian sausage. Cool. Um, but right, there's that something about that smell and that comfort food for me. Um, the other big one for me is uh, almost every Sunday we had um, pancakes for breakfast. Uh, and you're using pancakes and bacon. Um, and so that definitely that that's I mean, every, I'm, I don't know very many people who, who don't like the smell of bacon uh, cooking in the morning. Um, but but that in particular one is the one that has those some memories as well. It's like you said, those smells that really the smells take you back to the, those memories. I was going to comment on on you know what Stephen was talking about with with regards to wine, right? When I I think for me it's when I was finally old enough to to drink, and my father had finally you know sort of discovered good wine. So this is when I was probably in my early twenties, I guess. That was a memory to me when when you first you know kind of match a flavor of a wine with a meal, and you kind of feel that that pop in your mouth, right. Of, of just like the wine and the food kind of doing that dance and interacting. Um, that's kind of my, my memory. Right. And so I'm, I'm kind of like what, what Steven described is when, when I get ready to cook, I will pour a glass of wine and it's, it's, you know, some people like kitchen as a, as a social place. I, I kind of see it as just, it's a place of solitude before the craziness, right. Of the family dinner. But yeah, to, to answer your question, it's, it, it, to me, it's the, the memory is about being introduced to, to good quality wine and how to pair it appropriately with, with a meal. I mean, of course, bacon effort, right. I mean, but, but yeah, when you mentioned that it was, it was, it was going back to my, my grandparents had this really tiny house and there was no heat upstairs in rural Wisconsin. So you'd have like, seven quilts on you when you go to stay the night but then in the morning you'd you'd smell bacon and hear the sounds of co my grandmother cooking coming from the kitchen and it's just like okay i can get out into the freezing cold because there is deliciousness downstairs and one thing that's strict to me too tony as you were talking about that that sense of abundance that my my grandmother just instilled to my grandparents instilled I remember every single Christmas dinner at her house was we had been in a Norwegian area. We would have, of course, lutefisk and lefse and but we'd have kind of a Swedish meatball and mashed potatoes. But then she'd have some sort of roast beef and like three sorts of vegetables and things she called salads. But they were from the 50s, which involved whipped cream and fruit. <laughs> and um, it, but the table there was. There was not enough room on the table for all of the food and for your plate. And, you know, we'd all get our big bags to take home at the end of the day. But just this that feeling of everything is there. It's it's you know, there's you don't have to worry about there not being enough. And that stands out to me, too, just as something. I guess it's part of hospitality. I get, but that that idea of of. Uh, of abundance, I guess, too. Yeah, I like that a lot. Um, I, and I think that uh, it's important for us as Catholics, because I think sometimes we focus more on the the fast side of fasting and feasting, so that we're making sure that we are, you know, living in moderation, and including with food things. Um, and there's times for us to abstain from things or fast from things. Um, but it's important that when we feast, we feast, right? When, and that the abundance of that, especially like family holidays uh, or or important days on the church calendar, things like that, 
having a, a a table full of food and it doesn't have to be fancy food but just sensing the abundance of it and the bounty that uh that god's creation gives us uh i think is an important experience for for everyone you know yeah i really love that the and again that fits in again especially the very catholic nature of um the, the importance of the real and the importance of the the fact that uh you know we are in, in flesh you know again christ that god became man became incarnate that the um, you know, the physical world is not evil. It is a good that's been created, uh, but it's been a good that's been created to um, to be used appropriately. Um, and but but certainly the celebrations are an appropriate use, especially you know in the context of many of our memories talking about about families, um, especially larger families um, or friends or gatherings, especially in the context of the gathering of bringing people together around a, a, a common meal. Um, it's just something that is, I mean, I think it's it's just really at the core of human nature. and 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 food has that ability to do to do that in a way that that very few other things do. And again, you know, as, as Craig mentioned, wine, certainly, uh, again, good beer, good wine with those, um, obviously in moderation. but uh, but again, there's a, a role for for those things to to have um, and to be appreciated. I've been thinking about that a lot recently, kind of the difference between, so this is going off in a little bit direction from food, but both both with desire and enjoyment. So, I mean, with that feast that shows you God's providence and God's abundance and his, his graciousness, but he wants you to enjoy that. I mean, the enjoyment is something that is, is it's the desire that we have to measure and control, right? I mean, to, and, and think about a little bit. So, do I want to go get another bottle of wine right now? Well, maybe, but uh, when it's when it's open, though, it's it's meant to be enjoyed and and relished as as a gift, you know. So that abundance and those feasts, Tony, they just they they bring that about that this is kind of what we're we're called to eventually is is the the feast, you know. Yeah, I like all that. Um, it, it reminds me of um, also with my kids grow they're they're growing up as. Uh, middle class Americans, and so they they don't have any understanding of scarcity or or like, you know, doing without to the point where like we we can't have enough food for a time or we're blessed in that way. Um, so I I think sometimes it helps to foster gratitude or remind our kids of how blessed we are just for the, with the abundance we have. Um, but also I think you know I I try to tell my kids that uh, God could have made sunsets in black and white, and He could have made food not taste like anything he could have made it just fuel just to you know fuel our bodies but he didn't he made things taste good he made sunsets beautiful um so there's there's a richness and uh, of of the world that he made for us to live in that i think you experience at the table as well so shifting from uh, maybe a bit from from memories what are some of the do you have some some go-tos some favorites right now in in your current stage of life what are some of the things that you know, that jump out to you maybe a couple of, of things that you may, might commonly make or or that, that maybe you don't commonly make but you just really enjoy making yeah i mean i can i can start that one specifically when you get into like the celebrate celebratory meal right when you're when you're uh it's a weekend and you're you're trying to you know Hey, let's have a, a really good dinner and maybe eat something that maybe you would or, ordinarily get out at a restaurant, but you're trying to save money so you, you make it at home, right? Something that's really easy to make in that vein is a, is a good steak, right? And uh, so I will do that. You know, it's not often, maybe once every two weeks, but you get a good cut of meat, you know, from a from a good butcher. And um, I've got a you know an outdoor green egg, and I can I can get that green egg to 700 degrees, and I can. Literally, they call it Pittsburgh style, where you're really, really searing the steak for for like you know maybe two minutes aside, and then just baking it right in it for another few minutes, five six minutes, and it comes out steakhouse quality just about every time. Um, it's a great way, affordable way to have a meal that you know at a restaurant would be, you know, it would really hurt the wallet quite a bit. But if you if you do it in moderation at home, it's it's much easier to make. So that's that's one of my favorite things right now to make because it comes out so good. You know, yeah, that's varied for me a little bit. And I know back when we were in California or whatever, and I was, I'd often be coming home, having to do things quickly. And that's when beef price, I could go to Costco and get some really good beef at a low, at a low price, you know, some of the USDA choice or every once in a while, the USDA prime, which was amazing. But um, that would be the kind of the, the go-to because it's like, okay, 
well, not like every night, but it was enough. I have to confess at that time in my life that at one point I served up some steaks. I'm getting ready to enjoy it. And, and one of my children comes to the table and says, oh, steak again. <laughs> it's like, okay. What a problem. Yeah, I've we've got first world problems here in our household. So, so we adjusted after that a little bit, but uh, that was a, a different time of life. But brazing is the big thing for us now because I can find, you know, whether it's chicken or pork or, you know, lean cuts of beef, I can just throw it, throw it in my Dutch oven on this. I just do it on the stove. I don't throw it in the in the in the oven actually but you know then you can whatever flavor you want to add and then after about three hours the meat is just falling apart and i can either turn what's left into a gravy or a or a you know a really savory sort of sauce or whatever and and so again i think i overdo that and so my kids are like here we go again it's just the but once you get in that used to the things it's just easy to do that's that for me is probably the biggest challenge of cooking is having the time to be creative about different things but but definitely braised food is right now the the big thing um, i would say the things that i uh I, I love cooking um are the things that require like mothering over the course of several days um and i think it's partly because like like everyone here i'm a knowledge worker you know like i'm it's all everything i do for my profession is brain work so like i love doing stuff with my hands there's a, there, it's, it's almost like therapy. Um, but even something like a, a steak that is uh, quick cooking, um, I like a multi-day uh, salting process. So I'll, you know, I'll do a little like, you know, salt and then let it just sit in the fridge on a rack uh, to, to a, kind of a dry age, not, not the real kind, but, you know, an at-home version. Um, I, uh, pizza is one of the big things in our house, like homemade pizza. So I like uh, uh, that, I, like I, the process starts like probably five days ahead of when I'm going to cook. Um, and the cooking process is fast, but you know, making the dough and, and slow fermenting it and things like that. I really enjoy. Um, I think one, this time of year, especially when it's tomato harvest uh, season uh, and we're coming to the tail end of it. Um, but uh, there's a cherry tomato pesto recipe that uh, comes from, I think it's uh, Lydia Bastianich. I think is her name. It's pesto trapanese is the the Italian name for it. But it's it's a cherry tomato sauce you make in a blender. So you just put uh, tomatoes and uh, some kind of nut, either almonds or cashews will work, a bunch of basil, some garlic, um, and you blend that. And then you, uh, while the blender's running, you drizzle in olive oil. So it makes an emulsion with like the, 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 the uh, cherry tomato juices and the oil. And then you just toss it in hot pasta. And it's so good. It's the simplest, you know, simplest thing to make, but it's a family favorite for sure. Yeah, I love that. And I think for me, the I know the, the cooking has changed dramatically over the years, you know, when uh, early in the marriage and, you know, we've got a, um, you know, one young son or two uh, young boys, uh, you know, I was still able to do quite a lot of things. I mean, basically anything I wanted, um, you know, as that's changed, and we're now to the point where I've got a couple of teenagers and five boys ages 15 down to five. Um, I found that that's no longer an efficient uh, way to prepare meals. Um, you're trying to do a lot of the meals that I, uh, I liked doing before just uh, it just takes too much time or too many pans or too you know too much stuff to do on a, a regular nightly basis. Um, but the challenge is I didn't grow up despite my 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 dad being I mean midwesterner we I, I don't think I'd ever had a casserole until I got you know like down and went off to college. Um, so casseroles aren't a huge thing for me. It's been kind of a learning process of what does this look like and why would you use cream and mushroom soup? That stuff's terrible. Um, you know and and other pieces. But the, you know, I think the the kind of the evolution has been, okay, what can I scale up? You know, what can I actually scale to feed people? Uh, and especially what, what can I scale to feed people that will give me some leftovers so that I only have to cook every other night um, or, or two out of three nights um, has been a big piece. So the, um, you know, a lot more uh, one pot, one skillet type meals, things that I can kind of cook together. So, I mean, you Steve mentioned braising. That's a fantastic way to do that. Um, my sister got me a, a, an R2-D2 instant pot several years back, um, which is amazing. Uh, it's actually from George Lucas because she works for them, which is weird, um, but it's cool. Uh, so I have an R2-D2 instant pot literally from George Lucas. But we've, uh, if, you know, first it's like, I don't, what do you do with an instant pot? Um, but it turns out you do everything with it, um, you know, all the time uh, because pressure cooking makes it cook a lot faster, which is great when you're trying to, you know, finish dinner at five and get, get it on the table by six and still have something that, that you and other people want to eat. 
Um, uh, but I think a couple of current favorites, especially I'm, I, I hope and pray for fall and winter and when maybe it'll cool down. I think where we made it in the mid seventies uh, this week, so that's sort of progress. Um, is uh, there's a bratwurst stew recipe that I came upon a couple of years ago um, that I can make in the instant pot. You know, so kind of replacing, uh, adding bratwurst in place, and bratwurst is just amazing. Um, Tony, there's a shout out to uh, Midwest for you. Love me some bratwurst, uh, and then a chorizo t- a chili with chorizo um, that just adds that just delightful, um, you know, smoky flavor to your chili. Um, my kids have been asking for it for about six weeks. And I said, it, it is 105 degrees. I am not making chili. Chili is one of those things in the fall, though. I agree with you. It's just like, it's one of the things that I I, I used to do it in like the crock pot. I, I've actually never used an Instapot, but I hear people, you know, praise them because of the faster cooking times and, you know, versatility. Um, when I make chili, I put it in a Dutch oven and then put it on the green egg to infuse some smoke. So I leave it uncovered. Some of the smoke kind of infuses in it while it's bubbling up and, that ends up adding some good flavor to it. Um, but I found it does, it, it tastes too smoky the next day. So it's almost like the smoke is overpowering, you know, if you let it sit too long. So, but yeah, it needs to be a little cooler before I'm going to do that. Well, that makes me think too, as well, of different sort of the, the Instapot, you know, the, the big thing for me that kind of, that I hadn't really thought about was the sous vide. I don't know if any of you have done any, any of the stuff with the, the sous vide. I do turkey at, at Thanksgiving now in, with a sous vide. It takes a whole day, but I take the we my kids just like the turkey breast anyway. So turkey breast, stick it in the sous vide for 24 hours. You pull it out, just throw it in like a 500 degree oven to crisp the skin at the end, and super tender, super easy. So that was my weird. Normally it's just like just give me the Dutch oven, give me the the old things but then every once in a while you you run across the the neat gadgets yeah brian brian's pretty great turns out really 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 fantastic adding all that that liquid and that salt mm. brian well maybe there's more to add here Go, tony do you want to you want to jump in with a i was just going to add that when you guys were talking about the instant pot um and pressure cooking generally it reminded me of another favorite thing I, that i love making is is soup from scratch um, with a especially homemade stock, which my kids call oh. meat jello. Um, it it's just you, it, it takes soup to a whole new level where it's 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 just fantastic, especially in the cooler months, you know. But a, a hunk of like good bread, uh, you know, homemade or not, a good bread and a and a homemade soup of just about any kind, mm-hmm. um, I just love. And in this time of year, um, especially in, in October, uh, a pumpkin bisque is amazing. It's so it's super super good with a good bread. So I highly recommend uh you know that approach. Yeah, I, yeah, homemade soups uh, and a great and they're they're easy you know to make. Uh, that's that's certainly part of our family tradition. Is I mean after Thanksgiving we always end up with some uh, making turkey stock out of the you know leftover um, carcass. Um, and then similarly after uh, Christmas we we always end up making a ham stock you know with our leftover ham. And so you know we end up with some form of turkey soup or other type of things. And then um, you know a, a, usually does a lentil type uh, thing with the ham. And like you said, especially with that good, the, the thick hearty bread and, and the, the soup that well, it's cooking the stock. I mean, you simmer it for however many hours you're simmering it. So the house smells great. Um, and then if you're, you're either a freezing it or B, you take something and you're making the soup and then the soup simmers for as well. That certainly produces that again, those smells. It does. And the, in and and the instant pot or any kind of pressure cooker for stock is a nice way to like, if you're trying to be efficient, uh, Pressure cook stocks are awesome, and and I so, some would argue that the the pressure cooking actually squeezes a bit more flavor out of out of whatever you're putting in there. Um, so you know you pressure cook it and, and strain it, and you've got stock. And I think I think it's like under an hour that you can you can get it. So fun modern tools. Yes, tech wise, at least one of my essentials that I actually take with me if I know I'm going to cook anywhere is a is a thermopen, an instant read thermometer and i just don't know how people do it uh it actually other otherwise i mean i know well okay i know it's experience but you know the ability to like check my loaf of bread actually and make sure it's at the right te- temperature that i don't have dough in there or checking the chicken on the grill or whatever thing just to get that quick instant read to me is is uh i think that's one of my essential cooking tools at least but for me, is my knives. You know, I found that if I'm cooking it somewhere else, uh, that that 
people's knives just are never satisfactory to me. Um, the two most expensive things on our wedding registry were my my set of knives and my set of pans. Um, you know, with you know, the good you know multi layer um, things, more expensive than anything uh, my wife wanted, <laughs> certainly. A knife sharpener is one of my mm -hmm. other things that I'm taking. Just the just the little like woost off or whatever, just a quick so. But yeah, that's the other thing, and hope. And I hope that people don't, I figure if their knives are dull, they don't mind if I sharpen them. So um, for the most part, but uh, that's the, uh, that is what I have to take if, if I'm, I'm cooking someplace else. Well, as we're starting to wrap up, one other thing that, you know, again, with us being Catholics, we touched on this a little bit. I'm curious about, does anyone do anything um, uh, either liturgical or just again, kind of seasonal that, that stands out to you as particular things that, that you do that other people might, um, I mean, enjoy or benefit from? The thing, the thing we typically do on Easter is, is lamb. Um, you know, we typically do lamb on Easter. And again, going back to my father and a recipe, I think it was a Julia Child recipe that he had, um, where it's like you, you baste it in a, in a garlic, ginger, Dijon kind of, you know, glaze. And uh, it comes out just dynamite every time. But yeah, that's, that's our tradition is, is lamb at Easter time. Are you doing like a leg of lamb or a rack or how, what, what cut do you prefer? It, it depends on what's on sale, <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, sometimes I'll use a leg. Sometimes you can get like that um, Australian leg that is on, on sale at Costco, but it, it comes without the bone in it. So it's all ready to go. And you just kind of cut it into pieces that are a little bit more manageable, you know? That's great. I'm a big fan of lamb chops too. Just seared to mid rare. And just, they're so good. Mm-hmm. It, this isn't something we've done very regularly, but we, because of many of the guests we've had on the Colby cast and, and the different ideas of liturgical living and, and doing things, this last year on the Feast of St. Joseph the Worker, I tried to implement, we'll see if it lasts, the, uh, the making pasties. So a Cornish pastry with mm -hmm. vegetable, like a lot of root vegetables and, and meat in, in those, which I love, which I love, but uh so we'll we'll see whether that that continues. But it seemed like, given that it, it like the Cornish miners would like stick them in their pockets and as they're going heading off to the mine and heat them up on their shovels for at their their lunch break, it just seemed like a good working man's meal for the feast of Saint Joseph the Worker this year. But... I love that, and that's uh, uh um, Catholic. So I have that little streak of the 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 oddity in there. Um, you know, that's a that's a beautiful thing. You know, for me, I mean, a couple of ones. Liturgical living is something we, we strive to do as much as possible. Um, we celebrate all of our kids' various feast days. Um, we had a whole bunch of, we've got uh, three of our five kids are born in September, which means we all have a whole bunch of uh, baptismal anniversaries here in October, you know, as we're going through them. So we celebrate a lot of those. But on the cooking side, you know, there's a couple of them that, that we always do and some other ones that we'll hit depending on how we remember them, how crazy it is. Um, one of my favorite ones is that on the Feast of St. Lawrence, we always grill um, because that's fantastic. Um, we do, uh, do the pancakes on fat Tuesday thing as, as kind of a, a tradition. And then on the family side, for my mother-in-law side of the family, um, who are Mexican, um, they, they grew up doing Christmas Eve enchiladas. We did that for a while. We've transitioned them to New Year's, uh, enchiladas because, uh, Christmas Eve enchiladas, uh, tend to it make it difficult for us to get to, to, to midnight mass. Um, and so we've moved those over to, um, to New Year's Eve, but especially now that, uh, my in-laws are with us having moved to Oklahoma, my in-laws moved back to town. Uh, we can actually now do this together. And so, and that's one that my boys tend to help with is that they'll, um, they're involved with, um, you know, with, uh, with their mother and, and their grandmother and all kind of making, um, you know, enchiladas together as a, a family tradition, which I love. It's great. I don't, I don't have any, uh, uh, you know, liturgical uh, calendar items, but for the for our Christmas dinner, um, and sometimes Thanksgiving, uh, and I'm sure this is true for other traditions, but Italian Americans very much have the full American whatever you know thing and the full Italian dinner on the table, which is a ridiculous amount of food. Um, <laughs> but one thing that has like stayed at the Christmas Day dinner is ravioli. So we have cheese ravioli. And of course, that's the thing that most people eat of the expensive cut of meat that, you know, I spent days laboring over is like hardly touched, um, but it's fine. It's all part of the package. And and uh, so I think that's that's part of the fun of our, you know, one one traditional thing we definitely do every year. I was going to ask you guys how you feel about, uh, you know, seafood and, and the whole Lenten season, right? Because that's always a 
a subject here at our house. Uh, you know, my family likes to go to the fish fries for the social aspect of it, right? And I kind of feel like it's my excuse. It's like the one time a year that I actually get to cook seafood. Normally, my family doesn't really like it that much. And it's always, it's always that push and pull, because I say, I, I understand the idea of wanting to be communal and, you know, go hang out at the parish. But fish fry fish is not uh, is not that good, you know, if we're being honest. I'd rather cook, I'd rather cook, you know, a, a halibut or, you know, shrimp or shrimp and grits or something at home. Shrimp and grits might be one of the best things I've I've ever had. I, I, my wife and I traveled to South Carolina one year, and uh, I forgot where we went, but man, was that good stuff. So if that's if you're having a Lent, good job. <laughs> well, I can't do it the way I normally would, right, with the bacon and and doing uh, sausage in it. But yeah, you can definitely make good Gouda grits and and you know make a vegetarian version. Being a Midwesterner, uh, Fridays and Lent for us, if unless we want to go the fried direction, usually involves cheese. <laughs> so we don't get to experiment too much with the seafood thing. Um, but yeah, I, I I do very much enjoy uh, fish and seafood though, so I'm envious. Yeah, and, that, and that's one that again I've been I've been very fortunate with in that uh, I mean, my parents, despite the fact we now live in Oklahoma, so it's a little harder for me to get the seafood. But my parents still bring a cooler down every time they come to visit, which is like once in the fall and once in the spring. Um, and so there's usually some ham and uh, some salmon, some halibut, uh, you know, a few different things in there uh, which we make. Um, but we do meatless year round for the most part, so there isn't um, there isn't anything special about Lent when it comes to to the fact that we aren't doing meat. But for us, what what actually distinguishes it is we 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 tend to actually, for the most part, try and skip the fish as well. Is so that we'll actually go with um, you know beans or um, you know other form of of, of a protein, uh, you know a non-animal protein, just as a, a way to simplify it a little bit. Um, the hard part for us of of the of the Friday piece is remembering. Oh wait, it's Friday. We need to make sure we don't plan something that involves meat. So that's the big sacrifice. There is is trying to remember what it is that we need to be doing and, and what it is that we shouldn't be doing um on that front but um, for me it's more a matter of uh, i don't want to be going out and spending a whole bunch of money trying to buy something um that that feels like it kind of contravenes of uh, what we're trying to do with maybe fasting you know during lent and otherwise um but uh i mean you know it's uh, you, you certainly feed your family it, it, there's no it, it, the goal isn't that you need to like intentionally cause additional suffering um isn't isn't necessarily a requirement um, and yeah, you know, I mean, some of those parish fish fries might might qualify as like additional suffering, unnecessary additional suffering. Um, so I feel that makes sense to me. On the other hand, I've been to some of them that are really fantastic. And a couple in the Midwest um, had like a perch fry, um, uh, which was some just, I mean, nicely seasoned, lightly fried, very delicious. So hit and miss. We are not a big seafood family in our in our house. So I haven't cooked much with most seafood. It's it's always been the case where, you know, I haven't had the, well, I haven't had the opportunity like when I was young where you could get fresh local things. So growing up in a lot of, um, you, you could get fresh walleye pike, you know, in, in Wisconsin or, or panfish could even be delicious when you're, when you're there. But, but otherwise it was always like, well, would I rather have a steak or or this? So uh, then I tend to pick the, the steak, I think, for the most part. But uh, one of the things that just makes cooking interesting is I was get, getting ready to uh, go get dinner ready here is that food allergies. We, I've got in my house, we've got gl no gluten. Well, people with no gluten, corn, dairy, soy, orange, uh, sesame, not soy. Soy is one where we're okay with nuts, tree nuts. Um, I could keep going on, I think. But it turns out that what I grew up with, meat, potatoes, or meats, like you, you were saying, Everett, meat, starch, and vegetables works pretty well for all of those people, as a matter of fact. But I don't know if you guys have, have challenges that way with, with uh, trying to accommodate different diets and such. But We had one of our boys, one of the, one of the younger two, who had uh, not not a full on dairy like allergy, but definitely an intolerance uh, that was it, it made really unpleasant as far as uh, digestive for him. Um, and and when and it even affected nursing, you know, so even if it's something that was going uh, going through in nursing, so we actually we spent I want to say fourteen months uh, completely non dairy, um, which was um, a lot of work, uh, a lot of challenge. Um, you know, like I said, it definitely changes all your meal planning as far as what what you can do, what you can't do. Um, 
you know, it, we were, uh, I mean, very, I was very happy when we got to the point that was no longer necessary and we could start reintroducing it. Um, but that was definitely a challenge. And, and it is, I mean, that's a, a challenge that a lot of people face of, of, right, how do you modify a lot of those rest, recipes that, you know, I'd really love to do this thing, but I can't do this thing. Um, well, that's, uh, it's definitely time for the creativity to kick in. And the good, and, and this is where one of the areas we're blessed. I mean, the internet um, gives us so many more resources. You know, I mean, 20 years ago, it's, uh, I guess I will find a cookbook that's non-dairy. Um, and 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 hopefully there's a couple of good things in there where we're you know, here it's so much easier that you can actually go and find all kinds of different recipes and and look at them and say hey that one sounds really good um, and give them a try uh, that's definitely been a, a major benefit I mean, we we probably do have a new recipe maybe twice a month or so of things that we'll just go and give it a try find something and see if we like it and you know, one out of three of them maybe get added to the 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 ongoing recipe the cookbook that that we keep of our own personal stuff. Uh, we've been fortunate to not have any uh, food allergies or anything like that, except my children's uh, affinity to uh, hot dogs, pizza, and burgers, and claiming allergies to anything other than those three, <laughs> those three things. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we've been very blessed to not have to to deal with any of that. Uh, but one one funny thing is that I've got I've got one child who uh, if you give her a, a plate of like you know meat, starch, vegetables, something like that will eat all the vegetables and nothing else. And the other one will eat all the meat and nothing else. So the dinner table often is like, you know, Josie, eat your meat. Maddie, eat your vegetables back and forth. You know, <laughs> got to nudge, nudge them in the opposite direction, you know. Our, our very first one, very early, he's probably six or seven. Um, we actually had to tell him that he wasn't allowed to have any more vegetables until he finished his hot dog. And we went, what kind of world are we? This is really confusing. But again, part of it was that we, I mean, I grew up having vegetables with every meal. And so we just had vegetables with every meal when, when they were little. And that's just, they were used to eating vegetables. But that's just what you did. And they liked them. So. I have an almond allergy, but otherwise we, we don't really have anybody in our house that that's allergic to anything, but we do have dietary preferences. Like um, I have a, a gluten sensitivity. So I try to minimize that right as much as possible. And and overall, uh, you know, the other thing is, is health, you know, things start factoring in, right? So your choice of what you eat, right? Um, you know, I have a, a history of, of type 2 diabetes in my family, and that's that elevated blood sugar is, is in my blood, right? And so I try to minimize those carbs, uh, refined sugars and things of that nature and focus a lot more on lean proteins and vegetables. So um, I agree with Everett, right? It's it's like if, if you're trying to avoid something and the recipe is based on that, you can find an alternative on the internet pretty quickly, which is nice. All right, guys, this has been great. It's very much in the spirit of Colby Cast episode 78, The Colby Man Show. It's been a real treat getting to hear y'all visit about this. Wrapping up here, what's for dinner tonight? I think I'm going to do turkey, ground turkey tacos tonight. Okay. Like most nights, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> fair, <laughs> fair. I'll discover that when I go in my kitchen, see what I have. See what's in the cupboard, <laughs> right? It presents yeah, itself. It. Yeah. Okay. We've got leftovers from last night. I made a chicken bacon ranch uh, noodle pasta thing. Um, which is delicious because I mean all those flavors are it's hard for chicken bacon ranch to go wrong as a flavor profile right. and then you need to add something else to it so you know and make it turn into a pasta and uh, call it a meal deal and ironically because we have faith formation tonight on a Wednesday night and I'm on a podcast my wife is cooking tonight so <laughs> I don't know. there you go <laughs> nice. how ironic love it Craig and Tony and Everett Thank you guys for coming to visit with us today. It's always great to see you guys. Subscribe to the Colby cast on your favorite podcast app so that you don't miss an episode and let us know how we're doing by leaving a rating or a review. And as always, feel free to email us at podcast at Colby.org. Mary, our mother, pray for us. St. Maximilian Colby, pray for us. Ad maiorem Dei Gloriam.